Okay, so I'm going to do a few videos of some posts that I've done on my forum. Comments are disabled on my videos from now on on YouTube because I want people to go to my forum and comment there, okay? I, d I don't like YouTube, I'm just using it so that people can, you know, come and type, okay? Because I, I think that philosophy is something that has to be written. I, d I don't think it really works when people are having these exchanges back and forth uh, on YouTube, okay? I think they get a bit too heated and, you know, whatever. I've disabled the comments and so you'll have to go to the forum to comment. Simple as that. Uh, and I want, you know, I, I, I want to start a community that's not on YouTube, so yeah. So this is about Plato and mysticism, and this quote that I'm about to read is from Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel's The Phenomenology of Spirit, and it's from section 73 in the introduction. <clears throat> Between knowledge and the absolute, there lies a boundary which completely cuts off the one from the other. If the absolute were only to be brought on the whole near us to us by this agency, without any change being wrought in it, like a bird caught by a lime stick, it would certainly scorn a trick of that sort. If it were not in its very nature, and did it not wish to be beside us from the start. For a trick is what knowledge in such a case would be, since by all its busy toil and trouble, it gives itself the air of doing something quite different from bringing about a relation that is merely immediate and so a waste of time to establish. This quote is from the philosophical masterpiece by Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, The Phenomenology of Spirit. It best encapsulates the problem mystics, occultists and philosophers all have in common. How do you reach for and grasp reality as it is? He uses the analogy of a lime stick, which was used to catch birds in order to closely examine them, among other uses. But with truth, with a capital T, this just isn't possible, apart from the bird trying to evade capture. Hegel is part of a, tr of a tradition in philosophy that dates back to the ancient Greeks and Persians and Egyptians. Due to the limits of the senses, something that all philosophers and occultists all accept, there must be another mm -hmm. realm where all properties of this world exist in unity and whenever we use the lime stick to bring it into focus to examine it, we find we can't transcend these limits. The properties are just too abstract, too well hidden by unseen forces for our perception to even begin to comprehend them. This is a passion of philosophers and occultists. There is something secret. The secret does and does not have to actually exist for us to begin looking for it. We try endlessly to uncover apocalyptically, that is to say, to reveal the hidden from obscurity. Here arises a kind of paradox. How will you inquire into a thing when you are wholly ignorant of what it is? Even if you happen to bump right into it, how will you know it is the thing you didn't know? Man cannot search either for what he knows or for what he does not know. He cannot search for what he knows since he knows it. There is no need to search, nor for what he does not know, for he does not know what to look for. <clears throat> okay, so that was Mino's paradox from uh, Plato's, uh, yeah, so from Plato's dialogue. This makes inquiry both unnecessary and impossible. Socrates, when being praised for being the wisest of men by the Oracle of Delphi, replied, I know that I know nothing, which is to say he knew something and is therefore only partially ignorant and this makes inquiry possible again. What is the way to know more? How do we pursue the unobtainable and unknowable that may or may not exist? 
yet we are built to wonder about transcendental levels of reality. That is to say, a more than physical realm of existence and reality, the metaphysical. Plato's answers to these questions have had a massive influence on mystical thought and political thought in our world to the point where he may well be inescapable if we try to catch what is behind Plato's ideas with the lime stick we would encounter the same problems we've described. What really brings Plato in line with occultic and mystical thought is his theory of recollection which is also from the dialogue with Mino. It is this concept of learning as recall that adds another possibility, the concept of a pre-existent soul. It is important to not associate as of yet St. Augustine's notion of the Christian version of the soul, but we also can't leave out the influence of Plato on Christianity either. The view that truth is always proportional has been so deeply embedded in our understanding of ontology, the study of what there is, that we can look at an entire history of philosophy from Plato down to the 20th century as being essentially the same metaphysics-wise. The, limi <clears throat> the main limiting medium is language. An interesting discussion is on Plato's conveyance of what Socrates actually asserts that Plato probably wanted better terms to describe his forms and so a confusion in translations may have occurred. One only has to look at Diogenes, for instance, to see a very different interpretation of Socrates' anti-physical world view. That being said, let's look at the Logos, which literally means the word, spoken and thought, which immediately places a privilege on speech and thought over physical forms of language like writing. This wasn't word in the grammatical sense. Another related term was lexis, which also means count, tell, say, speak. Another related term is logic, which is the language of philosophy. Strictly speaking, logic is the reasoning behind argument, which again causes us to immediately believe that there is always an occult layer to knowledge. Okay, so the divided line, the simile of the sun in the cave. Uh, Plato was dualistic and he believed there to be two types of substance. Plato believed that the true substances are not physical bodies which are ephemeral but the eternal forms of which bodies are imperfect copies. These forms not only make the world possible, they also make it intelligible because they perform the roles of universals. More on this later, uh, as it is this layout that makes Plato the most popular among occult thinkers. There's another thread on the forum that describes in better detail what the central concepts of Plato are. Um, so you'll be able to read about his theory of forms, the simile of the sun, the simile of the cave and the divided line there, the link is in the thread. If you are not familiar with these concepts, please go and read that link uh, and come back here after doing so, by which here I mean there at the forum. Yeah, go and register. As you saw later in that thread, I briefly mentioned some of the connections to the Gnostics which I want to backtrack a little. Before we begin, I want to stress for you to pay attention to the layout of metaphysics across the many traditions that Plato is a central part of. We will examine reality, <coughs> sorry, we will examine really old traditions of thought and ancient religion, the revival of Plato through Plotinus and the creation of Neoplatonism, medieval traditions in Kabbalah, and then we will look at some of the more modern forms of Platonism from Theosophy and New Age discourses. I haven't got around to those yet, but I'll get to them. It is very distinct in its layout and structure. Once you know it, you will be able to spot it immediately. Uh, and I will finish by looking at some criticism of Plato and his metaphysics and how mysticism is framed outside of a dualist view of substance and the view of substances in general. Okay, so I haven't got to those just yet. Those are still to come. But anyway, Zoroastrianism. 
was a religion that started out in Hinduism. Mm. Excuse me. Zoroastrianism was a religion that started out of Hinduism in ancient Mesopotamia, also known as modern day Iran. It universalized the pantheon of Iranian gods that date back to the second millennium BC. Some sources claim that Zoroastrianism existed in some form during this period, making it the second oldest religion in the world. Zoroastrianism had priests known as the Noble Ones or Aryans. <clears throat> the Aryans love their language. Sanskrit means well formed and the Aryans believed it to be the perfect linguistic embodiment of the nature of reality. Some Western scholars have even believed that Sanskrit was the original language of humanity. Since the Aryans were migratory, they left in the way of archaeological evidence. Almost everything we know about them is based in what is now a collection of writings called the Vedas and this is the oldest and most sacred of Hindu scriptures. Originally and for thousands of years, the Vedas existed only in oral tradition preserved by special memorization techniques by Aryan priests. Um, so the Vedas were never intended to be written. The oral word as constructed with the written word is considered extremely powerful and potentially dangerous. Only the priests were competent enough to recite the Vedas effectively without causing a great danger. It is this caste system that we see in Plato and his politics. Although some aspects of Sparta were undoubtedly part of what Plato envisaged for the future, namely a certainty that is communicable only through a way of life and a way of life that would be implemented with the fewest possible changes, with maximum static perfection, and that good, goodness and reality are timeless facts of reality. Um, the best state will be the one that best copies the heavenly model, and only a ruler can best understand the eternal good. <clears throat> um, according to Charles William King, who was a gemologist around the end of the 19th century in his book, The Gnostics and Their Remains, Ancient and Medieval. The ancient Greek city of Ephesus was where two cultures probably intertwined. The school of Ephesus was a mystical school in Ionia, now modern day Turkey. The Greeks and the Persians were always constantly at war with each other, which always leads to a blending of cultures. As bodies clash with each other, they combine as much as they repel each other. More on this when we examine Alexander the Great in the next thread. Another apocalyptic text from the Zoroastrians is the Zenda Vesta, which literally means text and comment. It was collected from oral tradition dating back as far as 1200 BC. There is a supreme being called Zavana Akarana, which means boundless time, as no beginning can be assigned. So he, Zavana Akarana, is so surrounded by his own glory and so far exalted beyond all human comprehension that he can only be the object of silent veneration. That's from page 40 in Charles William King's book. The beginning of creation was made by means of emanations. The first emanation of the Eternal One was light. This clearly has a link to Plato and it preceded Plato. The Zoroastrians were very otherworldly, much like their later counterparts that we call the Gnostics. The influence of these metaphysics on Christianity should go without saying here too. Ahura Mazda, which means being mind, was the king of light, much like Plato's Demiurge and Gnostics Yaldabaoth, the first born out of the infinite, or boundless time. The Demiurge in later Gnosticism would be associated with Yaldabaoth, but had more in common with the Zoroastrian spirit 
Angramainu or Ariman, who was the destructive spirit that opposed Asha or truth. Representations depict a serpent with a lion's head for both, as Ariman is one of the six divine sparks or Am Shashpans, I don't know if I'm saying that right, sorry, of, Hodam, of Ahura Mazda, who created Asha. Ariman is like a perfect, is like an imperfect copy of Zavana Akarana. Okay, and then there's two images of Yaldabaoth and Angramainu, and you can see that they, they're both uh, lion headed serpents. <clears throat> In Zoroastrianism, Ahura Mazda was formless and uncreated spirit who had not yet been named. Um, and so the calling of names, his theory of naming, is another avenue of Plato we have to explore in due course. But Zoroaster, the prophet of the religion, also known as Zarathustra, gave a name to something that is formless and without object. Ahura Mazda is the equivalent to the realm of the forms, but is still trans transcendent even to that. It is the upholder and creator of the thing we attempt to catch with the lime stick, but all we are able to grasp and cognize or understand are the emanations in the form of justice, goodness, in their separate forms in the material realm which is not wholly wise, unlike Ahura Mazda. Ahura Mazda upholds Asha, or truth. <clears throat> and there's a picture of Zarathustra, who looks a lot like a blend of Jesus and Muhammad. Uh, anyway, so by means of his word, Ormonds, or Ahura Mazda, created the pure world of which he is the preserver and the judge. The Gnostic, that's from um, the Gnostics and their remains again. So in the beginning was the word, the Logos, which again puts a huge privilege on some kind of speech and thought over written texts. The cosmos is seen as a great book in which Ahura Mazda, as the word itself, inscribes signs and clues and an endless play of overlapping resemblances for men to interpret. What appears to us in our modern minds is an extraordinary subservience to authority, which is the consequence of a totally different epistemological framework. To the Aryans and Plato, however, whether or not this is a language problem of limitations, this was the ontology. It is important to remember the captivity of the Jews in Assyria. Only two tribes, Judah and Levi, were sent back to Jerusalem by Cyrus, and Babylon continued long to seek the most flourishing rabbinical school, while Judea itself, down to the time of the Macedonian conquest of Alexander the Great, remained a province of the Persian Empire. Kabbalah means to receive, and the Jewish influence was very vast, very vast in Persia. Okay, so Kabbalah, uh, as with Kabbalah and, and according to the Zender Vesta, all that exists has emanated from the source of the infinite light. And in the diagram, there's a picture of the tree of life and it shows three uh, semicircles above the tree. And they are Ein, Ein Sof and Ein Sof Er, which basically mean boundless in time, nothing uncreated, infinite light. Um, so before all things existed, the primal being, the ancient of days, the eternal king of light, this king of light is all. He is the real cause of all existence. He is the infinite Ein Sof. He alone is he. There is in him no thou, but he cannot be known. He is a closed eye. And that's from the chapter in the Kabbalah and the Talmud uh, in the Gnostics and their remains by Charles William King. This implies a kind of panentheism, which means all is in God. Once again, we see a similar story as regards 
causes are greater than effects and the realm of the forms was created by another being. Once again, we see a kind of spoken word as being the basis for all reality in the way Kabbalah compares the micro and macrocosms of the universe. yod Hey or Yehovah emanated from the firstborn of God, the Tikkun or universal type, which the platonic idea and the general container of all being, making this being similar to Ahura Mazda. The structure of the tree of life is most revealing of Plato's divided line. There are four worlds to the tree of life, which is the same as Plato's line. Uh, and in the diagram above, the worlds are divided by cross sections known as veils. <clears throat> there are technically five worlds, the first being Adam Kadmon which means primary of primaries. You could say this is some kind of template for how forms will manifest via emanations. Adam Kadman is supreme above the worlds and generally only four worlds are referred to, which again is the problem with the lime stick. It can only catch so much, or we can only see so much. So the first world is Atziloth, which is the world of emanation. So it's the highest possible order of Queditas or thingishness. Uh, and in the Republic 510b, there are two subdivisions, in the lower of which the soul uses the figures given by the former division as images. The inquiry can only be hypothetical. And instead of going upwards to a principle, descends to the other end in the higher of the two. The soul passes out of hypotheses and goes up to a principle which is above hypotheses, making no use of images as in the former case, but proceeding only in and through the ideas themselves. So this is so high up in the conceptive ladder that form is not yet possible in the way we can comprehend it. Let's use a few keywords to grasp what we're dealing with here. Let's say that creative forces, all the forms and ideas themselves, all principles of goodness and justice are just swirling around in a, in a, a harmony and embrace. And the idea, let's just stop just for a moment. Wouldn't it be just great to just stop and then carry on our blissful embrace for all eternity again. So the idea rest comes into being and rest would logically lead and follow from motion. So then the next world is called Braya, which is the creative world and the special relationship between a form and its essence is captured in two principles. One, each essence is the essence of exactly one form and each form has or is exactly one essence. A form then is what it is in its own right in that it is its essence. And since the only thing it is, is its essence, each form is monides of one essence. Its virtue of being its essence, each form is something, regardless of whether any particular does or even may participate in it. So from here, the keyword, keywords would move from the idea rest to the formative essence of resting, which is sit down or, or sit or lie down, something to rest on. Okay, and then in Yetzira, you have part of the creative world. This is well within Plato's visible as opposed to intelligible world, where we could say an actual plan or blueprint is drawn up for a chair or a bed, you know, for example. And then finally, in a sire, in the world of formation, where we actually see a chair, okay, that partakes in the form of the chair and also of resting and sitting. Uh, all chairs will share a universal particular. So that's it. That's just a simple example that shows the contrast well enough, you know. Um, and we're going. I'm going to conclude here. But again, if you want to 
comment, go to the forum. Okay, take care. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.